we're going to be talking to Jeff Shore and Todd Trivial about some of their mods, tips, and tricks. And just like I go into any turbocharger episode, we do listen to a lot of people with a lot of advice on turbochargers, especially some celebrities, who say that uh, the exhaust gases go into the turbocharger, spin it, witchcraft happens, and you go faster. So let's go ahead and find the mystery behind that tonight and talk to our guests. You know, so, uh, turbos are such an important part of the character of our Saabs. Uh, Saab was the first, you know, general manufacturer to really bring Saabs to the uh, motoring public and um, or bring turbos to the motoring public and you know the I, I've talked to a number of guys who've been uh, they sometimes ask me for help in finding a Saab and uh, I'll point out several good cars there's a great 900 convertible five-speed non-turbo on the site right now and a lot of guys say oh I, you know I just really want that turbo so there's just something about that isn't there Mark absolutely you know because I've only driven Saabs with turbos I really haven't experienced a non-turboed Saab I guess I'm kind of biased, and I always look for a car if I ever go to purchase one. Of course, I kind of had the curtail that habit. Anyway, um, I've basically gone to uh, accept the fact that most uh, Saabs out there have turbos, and it brings great joy when I hit the gas pedal, and uh, it goes zoom and whoosh, and I go down the road a little bit faster. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it does make it a lot more fun, but... You know, when it goes wrong, it's also a big disappointment, and that's why Absolutely. we've asked Jeff Shore to join us this evening. Jeff is from European Motor Service in Point Pleasant, Pennsylvania. Jeff, great to have you here. Hey, Jeff. Good to be here. Great. How are you doing? Uh, so you work on Saab's other cars as well, but uh, how often is it that a turbo problem brings people to you? Uh, more often than you realize. Uh, lots of Customers' common complaints are loss of boost, loss of power, um, and other shops can't diagnose it, and it ends up in my hands. Mm -hmm. And with all the problems that you happen to see, I know that you see a multitude of them. Can you give us some uh, ideas as to what you typically see, or you have some oddball things that the SOP owner should be on the lookout for? Well, there's uh, specific things for every model, every engine. Um, and there's always the basics and everything mm -hmm. across all, all cars. The simplest things is all hoses eventually deteriorate, break, leak. Uh, sometimes mm -hmm. if there's oil in the system from a turbo that's got a little excessive blow by, uh, you get some slippage and some hoses could pop off. Mm -hmm. I know I that like um, we've. I know that we've seen, uh, because of the age of these vehicles now, we're starting to see some of those problems crop up. Like, you know, you mentioned just now, uh, vacuum hoses having cracks mm -hmm. in them, seals letting loose, stuff like that, oil getting down to the system, you know, excessive oil causing smoke coming out the tailpipe, things of that nature. So I know that sometimes we kind of be on the lookout for some of these typical symptoms. And, um, you know, really, with the turbochargers, uh, Sometimes it does take uh, actual place in this turbocharger in those cases, but uh, can you walk us through uh, what you see as far as diagnosing those systems? Uh, yeah, I mean, each thing, sometimes it's more specific in the, the, the customer's complaint or concern. Um, mm -hmm. the, the most common ones that I see lately are a car acts like it's got no boost, it's running around in what would be considered base boost, which is... Uh, it, it's producing a few pounds of boost, but it's not, you know, the, the kick you back feeling. Um, and the electrical solenoids on the, uh, well, just every sub produce has some form of electrical control. The turbo and mm -hmm. you get the boost control solenoids, uh, the support sedans have two of them. Uh, V6s mm -hmm. have one, uh, the 9.5s, the old 9.3s, the old new gen 900s, and Classic 900s, 9000s, they've got one as well. And uh, if that one main component isn't working as it's supposed to, then you're going to have no boost. So walk us through some diagnostics here. So the first thing I'm going to do is check for leaks in all the hoses, okay? Check. Got that one down. And uh, I suppose then model specific, what are you thinking is is the best next step in diagnos diagnostics? Mm -hmm. uh, well, the newer the cars, uh, you the more information you can sometimes get from just connecting a, a scan tool and pulling the codes um, and seeing which fault code the car set, because sometimes uh, you get like a 33 code and a sports sedan, which could either be the recirculation valve 
or an actual uh, boost control solenoid valve uh, that's going bad. Um, there are a few other codes related to the solenoids that are specific or just uh, if you're driving along and you suddenly lose all boost altogether, pull over, put it in park, cycle the ignition, start it up again, and you have boost again, uh, that's usually an indication you've got an electrical problem as well that's uh, cutting the boost in the car. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you said there was some pictures. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Walk us through those. <clears throat> Yeah, I did say you did send us some pictures, Jeff, and we were going to go ahead and uh, put those up on the screen and wanted to get your yep. feedback as to far as uh, what those relate to, what problems we see. And I see here we have a picture. Can you tell us about this picture part we're seeing right now? So this is your the wastegate actuator, which every mm -hmm. turbo car has one of some form or another. Uh, that mm -hmm. is what's vacuum actuated. So a vacuum hose is what's going to the upper right corner there, the fitting. And then that rod, which is uh, runs off of a diaphragm inside in the spring is connected to the wastegate on the turbo. Uh, mm -hmm. If for any reason that loses its ability to hold vacuum or gets disconnected from the wastegate, you will have mm -hmm. uh, clear boost problems at that point. Uh, most recently, I saw one of these where it actually snapped off the mounting ears at the turbo and the car had uh, low boost conditions. Um, oh, gotcha. I mean, they break and can go bad in any way you can imagine. Hmm. Yeah. For our, for our viewers at home that don't know what um, a wastegate does in a turbo, can you describe to how that controls the flow of uh, the exhaust gases to better uh, operate the turbocharger? Uh, it, it's it's more for uh, when you you let off the throttle uh, so that there's not mm -hmm. a boost in the middle, and vent and dump it in the exhaust as a safety engine in the vehicle. Uh, so obviously, if that's oh, not that's working gotcha. as designed you're putting the engine in at uh, higher risk of failure. Yeah, so you obviously you need it there. Uh, on my old, you know, I've got a classic 900, and I found that uh, on that device there is a, a, an, ex an adjustment. And uh, I was uh, able to extend the length of that rod, and that helped restore some boost pressure for me. Does that make sense to you? Uh, yeah, I mean, the base boost, I mean, it's very model to model, and that's what you're setting with the waste gate actuator rod. You're setting your base boost. Uh, so the higher that number is, uh, the more boost that you could potentially gain uh, on your driving conditions. It's a pretty simple process just to get under the car and take off a little safety wire and extend that. Um, I just, why over time would that suddenly change? I mean, it, the length of the, it hadn't moved, right? Something within the actuator had to have it's, failed. Right. The, the spring and the diaphragm that's internal, that sometimes they get tired and they don't have the strength that they used to have. So by adjusting mm -hmm. the rod, you're making up for the, the slack that's uh, being created internally there. All right. So if you got an old classic car like mine, uh, give it a shot. I guess you're not going to cause any harm. So uh, this is a crossover pipe in a V6, you said? Correct. It's actually the uh, the rear crossover pipe, uh, which on the 2.8 the turbos, it's a, a very high failure item. Um, and it's mm. the pipe that connects from the exhaust manifold to the turbo. Um, so when they crack, you have several problems that are created, one of which is uh, a little bit of loss in power and, and because you're losing the exhaust flow mm -hmm. to the turbo. So in this image, I guess, uh, we're trying to show here that those things do develop cracks. Is that something you just kind of listen for, feel for, get down there and, and search for? How well, do you find yeah, it? I mean, the worse they get, the louder uh, the exhaust leak becomes. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not a, it's like more of an air uh, leaking sound more so than like a broken flex pipe under the car. Um, you will smell the raw exhaust uh, the more that crack uh, separates, uh, you'll notice that the boost is starting to drop off. And uh, if you have aftermarket uh, gauges or ability to see the exhaust temperatures, uh, you will actually see the EGTs uh, start to rise, which is not a good thing. Mm -hmm. so fixing that pipe is fairly critical. Gosh, you know, a million years ago, uh, <laughs> Yeah, this is back when I was a teenager. Uh, some old mechanic who lived in the neighborhood, uh, I was working with him, and he said, hey, boy, go in and get me a Kleenex. <laughs> Fine. So I came back out, and, and he tore off a bit of the Kleenex, 
and put it in between some needle nose pliers and then was putting that down around the exhaust to find out where the exhaust leak was. So when he hit the exhaust mm -hmm. leak, you could see the Kleenex moving. So mm -hmm. who would have thought like you need Kleenex in your toolbox? <laughs> kind of like the canary in the coal yeah. mine, eh? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, let's roll on down. Here's another item that uh, can sometimes fail. What are we looking at here? Uh, it's the, the, the boost control valve, boost uh, BPC. Uh, it's, this is specifically the one from the Trionic 7 vehicles, the, uh, the old Gen 9.3s and the, the 9.5s uh, that ran the 2.0-liter and the 2.3 turbos. Um, and again, that's the, the three vacuum lines on the bottom there uh, go from mm -hmm. the turbo, the wastegate actuator, um, and the one actually goes to well, the, the inlet housing on the turbo, the mm -hmm. inlet pipe to the turbo, and then the, the wastegate. And again, electronically controlled, the connector up. Uh, these commonly just kind of go bad with age and sometimes physically fall apart. Other times you can have a, a no boost or low boost scenario with them. Mm -hmm. And how would I know that that has gone bad? Uh, you can actually, uh, one of the ways to test them is to uh, pull off the one uh, vacuum line uh, that goes to, uh, I'm trying to remember if it's the, <laughs> the wastegate or the evap line, you block it off and uh, if the boost comes back, uh, then then you know that that valve is not working the way it's intended. And interestingly enough, to go along with that, um, I've actually had a couple guys show me a mod to where you'll take a vacuum line off that actual valve and put a bolt in that line, and that's supposed mm -hmm. to help increase the boost. Uh, can you explain what's going on there? I believe that's the one where they're blocking off the, the line that uh, feeds to the EVAP system on the earlier cars um okay I, uh, i'm not entirely sure if that's actually doing anything other than bypassing the little hose that breaks all the time um mm -hmm. which do 88 cells a replacement they're like 20 25 dollars a silicone hose um other people i know have deleted the evap lines entirely um if the system's working the way it's supposed to and the car's got a tune in it i don't personally see a reason to block that line off other than for diagnostic gotcha. reasons. Okay. I was curious, yeah. Uh, and uh, what are we looking at here? You sent this image along? Right. So these are the solenoids on the sports sedan. Uh, the four cylinder, the two liters, use two of them one at the throttle body, one at the turbo on the actuator itself. They are different mm -hmm. part numbers and they have the specific locations. Uh, and the V6 utilizes one of those that's directly on the inlet side of the turbocharger. Uh, and that in itself is what's regulating your, your boost. And uh, again, these can throw check engine lights and codes. Um, again, mm -hmm. making sure the hoses are hooked up in the correct orientation. Uh, they're not cut, broken, or leaking is also critical, as well as the connectors are securely attached. Uh, oftentimes, people disconnect them. It's got a release uh, uh, squeeze and I've many seen those that lock the connector on just missing so the connector falls off or it gets loose and can again give you no boost if it's not making a good connection they can't mm. interpret what the car is doing yeah I see what you mean there if you look closely you'll see one of them is, is labeled as part one and part two are they different why why would two different part numbers Physically looking at them, you will. I've never noticed anything physically different, but there's got to be a, a, a difference, I would think, with the uh, diaphragm or electrical uh, uh, circuitry inside going on there with the vacuum. Because mm -hmm. um, I know if you put them on backwards, you will have codes and it's not going to run right. Uh, just like if you put two mm -hmm. of the same on the car, you've got the same scenario. Mm -hmm. Hey, and just a quick note to the guys watching out there on Facebook, um, we're unable to put the comments up on the screen, but uh, everybody watching can see those at the same time. So Kevin Mulcahy is uh, uh, lending his input there on a few points. So if uh, you're over on YouTube, you're missing out some good content on the Facebook side of things. Just a heads up mm -hmm. for you there. Uh, these guys are pretty commonly an issue, right? Right, so these are the uh, the coil on plugs again for the two liter sports sedans. Um, if you have packs that are going bad, you'll have misfires and stuttering, which 
Again, other shops misdiagnose as transmission problem more often than I can understand why. Uh, but if you were to place one and you don't get the OEM, which is the issue on the right here, uh, the aftermarket ones, oftentimes you'll put them in, even though the car runs smooth, might not misfire, you could have no boost at all, uh, just because that part is not engineered correctly for the car. Uh, so mm -hmm. putting the correct coil pack on the car and spark plugs is a huge uh, performance gain and reliability and just... It's just silly not to spend the money and fix the car correctly the first time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like with ignition components, particularly, you want to go with the OEM on these cars. At least that's been my experience, right? Absolutely. Or at least the OEM manufacturer if you don't buy directly from Saab. But. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. And along those same lines. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> yep, the uh, Trionic 7 ignition set, uh, the, uh, the T5s would be red. This is the I mean, same scenario. I mean, it's very important that you have a factory original ignition cassette. Uh, I have seen more and more lately the, uh, some of the replicas or clones uh, that have been working um, much better than they originally did when they first started producing them. But uh, I will only ever run a factory cassette on my own car. Um, mm hmm and usually if you want to make sure that, you know, if once it's getting near 10 years, you probably do for a new one. Uh, they usually will last about 10 years, at least under stock conditions. Um, but you can definitely get some loss in power from a, a failing cassette. What's the price differential between one of those and uh, one of the knockoffs? Is it is it gigantic? I mean, it can't seem like at, it'd be that. At this, at this point in the game, it's... Oftentimes, I've seen some of the aftermarket ones are more money than just buying the car. Hmm. Um, going back 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. Um, but, I mean, there's, there's definitely a, a huge price drop, uh, I'd say, in the last decade on those ignition cassettes. Um, they run anywhere between, I'd say, what, 250 to 320 uh, to get yeah, the genuine that's right. one. Um, I know some sites like... The saw parts all for them, even with the spark plugs. Uh, so you mm -hmm. get plugs with the ignition cassette, which again, it's if you don't run the right plugs, you run the chance of burning out that ignition cassette. So why take the chance? Yeah, why take the chance? Um, you know, just a little bit uh, before we switch over to the next part, I just want to add in that uh, some tips from the guys where you use dielectric grease on top of the spark plugs or in the end of the coil packs or so forth that helps. Uh, a seal. Um, it seems like it helps seal that connection between the spark plug and the coil itself. Um, but I just wanted to share that with our viewers out there because I have seen that um, actually work well on my own sobs to where it'll seal that connection between the spark plug and the coil and it'll keep dirt and debris out. So that could potentially uh, keep those uh, uh, things out of that uh, possible uh, failure point for uh, ignition between the spark plug and the coil. Just want to add that in there. Hey, before we move on, anything, it also keeps the moisture out of there, so you don't have corrosion. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, absolutely. Big deal. Uh, Matthew Grubbs, friend of the show, thank you, Matthew. Suggested, uh, how do you check the the um, date and and of your DIC? How do you how can you monitor that? So if you go back to the picture of the uh, the that right the duction, which is K. 3.4 D or that's the version of it. So this is a, a, a fair ignition because right below that, that there's one, 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 seven in this on this one here. Uh, this is actually, I believe a pre recall ignition cassette that I had laying around. Uh, so that is actually 2001 and it's the 16th week of production. Uh, and you also notice the part number next to Saab there is a 919 number, which has been long superseded uh, by a, a 555 part number. Uh, but that 0117, that is your date code, and it is year and then production week. Awesome. Okay, that works. Good deal. All right. Uh, man, this is a mass airflow sensor, right? That is correct. Again, uh, T7, Trionic 7, uh, mass airflow sensor. What happened? What's a, what do I need to be watching out for one of these? So in that 
photo there, you can actually see uh, the resistors that are what's uh, doing the work of uh, measuring the air volume, uh, temperature, everything that's going through that. Uh, as it's as the air is being drawn through your air box down to the turbo itself uh, so a clean mass airflow sensor is always a very important thing uh, an unrestricted one meaning good air filter no mouse nest no dog food in your air box anything that could uh, <laughs> come up this and this is the back side of the airflow sensor uh, the honeycomb is actually on the front side which acts as a, a kind of like a filter to keep more debris out um, and if that sensor is not reading correctly uh, or gets, again, it's an aged item, uh, it can actually cause your engine to lean out uh, and you have detonation issues or in, uh, ultimately end up with a hole in a piston, which you don't want. Um, so mm. it's critical that the car is registering the accurate airflow that's going into the engine so it can regulate everything accordingly. Yeah, yeah. Speaking along with that, mm -hmm. I actually experienced mm -hmm. a lean condition on Sterling it's my 2006 95 wagon, and when I had the engine rebuilt, um, we actually found that there was a uh, buildup and a little bit of damage happening to two of the uh, pistons and two of those cylinders. So definitely, the mass airflow contributes to the health of the engine, especially when regulating yep. the full fuel flow, which uh, that goes right along with what you just said, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, as you can see in the other photo too, it gives you the arrows of direction, so it kind of. The, the, the part that's making it as idiot-proof as possible <laughs> so that it's installed <laughs> in the correct orientation, uh, which is also mm -hmm. huge because I can't tell you how many times I've had a car come in, whether they had a complaint or not, uh, and it had it just wasn't running quite right, and that was installed backwards. And it, it doesn't take mm -hmm. much because it will install backwards, no problem. But, again, that, that label that's there with the arrows <laughs> kind of helps rule out that from happening, you would think, and... Uh, again, this is another part like the ignition cassette that if you're uh, turning up the boost, tuning the car, and you don't know when that was replaced last, buy a new one. Uh, try to buy a genuine mm -hmm. one as much as you can. Like, there's another part that has drastically dropped in price over the years. Um, mm -hmm. I think they run anywhere between 65 and $90 now mm -hmm. uh, when they used to oh, be wow. 250 300 Wow. So, yeah. That's yeah, why awesome. not? So, uh, you know, one of the, the things that happens with any uh, turbocharged engine is when you compress the air going into those cylinders, it picks up temperature. And that is where uh, adding a larger intercooler comes into play, right? Yep, absolutely. I mean, there's several advantages to putting a, a quality intercooler that's uh, the correct size for the car uh, in place of a factory intercooler. Mm-hmm. Uh, this this would be what I believe it's the Evo 8 upgraded intercooler, which is a common upgrade for the sports sedan uh, community. Uh, it gives you a much larger volume capacity. It's all aluminum. Uh, the end tanks aren't plastic. It's all one, one welded unit. Uh, mm -hmm. You have a very large uh, tube and fin or bar and fin uh, set up, which the cooler your intake temperatures, the more boost you can maintain um and then also potentially produce well you just uh, passed over something pretty quick there on the uh, mention of the end tanks um yes. that's a significant issue check those end tanks right yes the uh nine fives uh, i mean i can't tell you how many when i worked at the dealership uh, i took a car out after doing a bunch of work uh, go out on a road test uh, get on it to make sure there's no problems and you get the the nice loud pop flash and check engine light and the rough running condition and it barely wants to stay running with uh, any throttle uh and more often than not it was the stock and intercooler where the plastic tank would just blow right off or crack uh sometimes there'd be a hose that pops off of it but more often i saw that the tanks themselves were failing specifically mm -hmm. on the nine five arrows um, haven't mm -hmm. really come across that in a few years, but it's always something that could happen. And here's just a quick look down inside the intercooler. What are you trying to show us here, Jeff? So this is showing, this is what a proper intercooler should look like, where you have uh, the bar and plates with the fins that the air is passing through for cooling. Um, some of the aftermarket stuff uh, is more like, um, so this is a, a bar and plate where like a, a cooling system and a radiator would be hollow tubes 
with the fins. Uh, mm -hmm. This is more ideal, and this is how you want one to look inside for an intercooler, uh, since it's doing air-to-air -air cooling. Now, when it comes to intercoolers, bigger is better in many cases. And, you know, in the classic 900s, that thing is, you know, tiny. Little th the intercooler is just tiny as can be. And you told me about a hack for that I want to hear more about. Tell me, tell me that gimmick again. So there's a few things you could always do, but the most common one that I remember was you can find a, a size-appropriate electric cooling fan from any junkyard, I believe, I think it was a Volvo uh, in particular, I think had a, a cooling fan that would uh, attach on the back side fairly easy. Um, and you could either wire it up to the fan switch on the 900 radiator uh, coolant hose, uh, or you can just hardwire it up to a toggle switch. Uh, that way you can physically regulate when the uh, fan kicks on to help uh, drop some of those temperatures on that stock intercooler and help with those intake mm -hmm. temperatures. Cause it's, again, it's, it's better that it has one than not having one, but the cooler you can mm -hmm. keep your intake temperatures, the better it'll be. Well, we're going to uh, pay attention to cooling in a different direction. And uh, welcome, Todd Tribble, to the program. Todd has uh, hacked his uh, Saab 900 air conditioning system. Talk about cooling. Hey, Todd, good to see you. Hey, Lee, Mark, greetings. Good to see you again. Thanks for having me. Good to see you, Todd. Good deal. Okay, so uh, I think people might be familiar with your car, the famed Biazza. Here she is, looking great. What have you done to this car? Well, the, I live in the south. In fact, that picture was taken in Dallas. And the temperatures down here in the summertime just get up in the, the low low hundreds, and it, it's really unbearable. Obviously, the Swedes are not known for their air conditioning. Mm -hmm. um, the heating works marvelously in the, the most – obscene conditions when I lived in Europe, heater was, was blasting, but the air conditioner, it's, uh, it struggles. Um, I got, uh, I was hitting in the fifties during the summertime and I just got fed up. I, and this was just before I came to, to Albany when we saw each other there. Um, so I, I looked at the possibilities and, and started researching how to lower air conditioning temperatures, not just with automobiles, but also with buildings and commercial structures and whatever. And I, I, I realized that it might be an interesting concept to apply some commercial structure uh, reduction in uh, insulation for the tubing that, that carries the air conditioning from the EVAP to the condenser and um, uh, or, or vice versa from the condenser to the EVAP. And uh, so I, I started looking at that and, and found some tubing uh, that I actually just picked up at Home Depot. I got some insulating uh, heat reflective tape and, and so uh, fit those around the, uh, the tubes that carry from the compressor to the condenser and then back to uh, the EVAP and, and to the uh, evaporator coil uh, in, in, in the engine. So you see there on the left side of this picture, that's where the evaporator is up in the uh, uh, compartment and it runs all the way down from the compressor which would be on the top left of the screen down to the the front where where the con uh, condenser is and um, it, it really dropped temperatures about uh, I would say five six seven degrees uh, you know compared apples to apples on the same day with the same temperature before and after I was really shocked um, in fact, that I, I just put it on temporarily, and it's worked so well, I haven't taken it off and, and, and brought it back to be a, a little prettier uh, at this point in time. So there you can see the 60, almost 60 degrees before uh, actually installing this. And I think there's another shot that you've got. Yeah, so we dropped down to about, so it's almost 10 degrees. I think we're getting about 8, 9 degrees uh, delta out of that, which in any air conditioning environment is fantastic. Yeah, That's for awesome. just the cost of a little bit of, uh, of tubing and some foil tape. That's a, that's a pretty good hack. Look at that. It is. Story it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they, they say uh, necessity is the mother of all invention. There you have it. I guess so. Um, good deal. So uh, any uh, – it doesn't look like that's a very difficult thing to do. Um, yeah. 
what'd you, what'd you have in that? About 20 bucks? Uh, I don't remember. I think the tape was probably the most expensive. I think it was like 25 bucks for a roll, but you don't really use, I bought a big roll. You don't need it. Um, it you can use, a, a, they sell smaller rolls for less money. And, and the tubes, I think, are a couple bucks for six feet or something. Mm-hmm. Um, it does require two different size tubes if you want them to fit snugly. Cool. So I think one one's an inch tube and one's a, a, a half inch or a three quarter tube inside diameter. Well, that's cool. Love hearing about that, um, guys. We've gone uh, over our our guided headline of a half hour or so. Do you want to wrap us up with anything? You want to leave us with anything there, Todd? Uh, I just have a question. Since we're talking about turbos, has anybody ever tried to put uh, a, an evaporator, uh, the, 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 the part where the cold air actually comes through into the, in, into the inside of the car? We're talking about fans. What about actually using air conditioning to cool the, the, the temperatures on that? Has anybody done that? I believe Dodge has with their Hellcat motor. If I'm not mistaken, okay. I do believe they actually have used the air conditioning system and circulated refrigerant throughout the, uh, I guess, whatever part they call it, they do actually recycle the refrigerant through that part to actually bring down temperatures uh, between drag runs. So I've actually have seen Dodge actually does do that, which is uh, it's a good point, And uh, it's interesting to see they actually incorporate that with their latest designs. That's uh, that's fun. We we got to try that, Lee, on the the nine hundred. See if we can get the intercooler cooler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, I'm gonna look you to engineer that and you prototype it, and I'll follow your lead. How's that? Perfect. <laughs> perfect. Hey, Jeff. Anything you want to leave us with? We're gonna wrap up. Uh, not that I can think of right now. All right. Hey, guys. Appreciate you joining us, and uh, everybody who's hanging out with us here online. Thanks a lot. Uh, lots of good comments in the uh, in the chat tonight. Sorry we couldn't get that up for you. We'll work on that and make that a goal for next time around. But uh, lots of knowledge being shared out there in the Saab community, and that is, I guess, one of the greatest part of, of all of the, uh, the support that we get on Facebook from everybody so willing to share information and experiment. It's really kind of a great community. Glad that you're part of it, guys. Thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me back. You bet. See you guys. All right, Mark. Well, that was a lot of fun, huh? Absolutely. Uh, I think we're going to be seeing some more uh, guys run over to Home Depot and Lowe's now, now that Todd shared his mod with us. So, yeah, we're going to be seeing some sales drive there. So if they want to buy some stock in the stores, who knows? But, um, yeah, I, I learned a little bit tonight myself, and hopefully their audience uh, learned some with us because, uh, man, those mods, tips, and tricks keep on coming from the soft community. I'm looking forward to learning all kinds of new stuff. I agree. I'd like to learn uh, why we're uh, suddenly off screen, uh, and I don't have an answer for that. Um, but now we're back. <laughs> That's right, because sometimes we just exist in the atmosphere. <laughs> That's kind of the metaverse thing. Yeah. All right, fellas, uh, we're going to wrap this up. We hope that we'll see you next week here on Sob Talk Live. Take care, Mark. All right. Take care, Lee, and everyone have a great week. We hope to see you next week. Thanks, Jeff. We'll see you next time. Good stuff. Can't hear you, Lee. Nope. Still Mr. Silent. Nope. Mute button. (laughs) A little more complex than that on the software we're running, unfortunately. (laughs) There, now I'm back. Woohoo! All right. Did you realize when you when you went on air initially that at least I wasn't seeing here? I was trying to pull it up on another computer until it came on. Seems like the intro there was no sound, and in the beginning first 10, 20 seconds there was no sound. Yes. Okay. So I was playing with what's called the triggers in this software and discovered that I had a I had uh, made an error in programming. 
So um, that's okay. I, I just just feedback. I, I know this is all experimental, so exactly. Uh, yeah. Just. And that's that's kind of you know pushing the envelope a little bit with each episode being off for a couple of weeks kind of set me back here. But uh, this software is so cool. I can build a macro sequence so that this plays, that plays. When this wraps up, that starts. This starts. That mm -hmm. executes. And I miss that one step of activating the main audio output. So you live and you learn. It's all good. It's all good because I'm going to a comic relief to go ahead and help uh, surface through those. Uh, technical difficulties <laughs> <laughs> right and the weird thing about you I've, I've not seen you on a show be so animated yet I, i'm sorry for your troubles at work but um it, it's doing you doing you really well in your your personal sob life <laughs> maybe it's just my angst and frustration coming out in a different form who knows <laughs> Fair all right, right. Uh, so you're uh, you're shouldering me with the air conditioning job on the uh, intercooler. I got to get an intercooler first. I've got an '84. Oh, no intercooler. Right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Well, you know, my hope is to T5 mine uh, this this winter, and so I think in that process, I'm gonna I'm looking at putting in a DO88 uh, intercooler as well. Um, I understand okay. those are really great and make a big difference in output. So yeah, I'll have to play with oh. that. Are you going to be hitting Jordan up the been Jordan for that? Say what? Are you going to be hitting up Anthony Jordan for that? Because I remember he had uh, uh, some of the T5 kit, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Jordan Pagano. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Or Jordan. Yeah. That's like, I, I, he's I he's been pushing me to T5 uh, Biazza as well. Oh, is he good? And uh, I, I, I'm 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 right on the fence. You know, I've gotten I've gone to all the trouble to get all the lines, and and I've just rebuilt some more fuel lines. I've got up in the garage. I had another fuel line break, hmm. and I, I figured out how to rebuild those and sourced all the parts. Um, but you know, I'm probably gonna <laughs> cave sooner or later. You guys are gonna get me, and I'll I'll T five it. Well, I'll tell you what I. Uh, um I've got that uh, that second uh, 94 convertible that runs just so well. It's been unmolested. It's it's just a, in remarkable condition. And uh, it pisses me off then every time I get in my uh, CE with the rebuild engine that the other one runs better. So the T5 is, is sort of a, a revenge issue for me. Oh, okay. <laughs> Make it personal. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for, for having me. Y'all have a good night. Uh, you too. See you, Mark. All right. Take it easy, guys. See you, Mark. Take it easy, Lee. Bye. Good to see you, Tom.